think about leadership, we have to start with mindset. How does the mindset of the leader work? Mindset, we move forward to think about leadership as relationship. This is where we have to think about the way that relationships are communicated in such a way that the leader harnesses the energy of those relationships. Leadership is about energy. So mindset, relationship, and then we look to how those energy energies are used to help create action to make the world a better place. Now, when we look at leadership, you see all forms of leadership. You see all types of leadership. But in the end, it comes back to who you are as a person. And that is the foundation. The greatest source of energy for a leader, once they have food and oxygen, is their values. What do they do leading for? And what is the outcome that can be expected? And the purpose behind it. And we look at somebody who is an icon like Nelson Mandela who spent 27 years in prison and came out speaking reconciliation and forgiveness for 27 years remembering I am there for a purpose to help bring South Africa out of apartheid. And he used one simple poem, if you've seen the movie of it, in which I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. This kept him inspired. Leaders are about inspiring not just themselves, but those around to harness the energy to make the world a better place. And then we look at somebody like uh, Gandhi, who had no formal uh, political power, transforms the whole country of India based on one experience. He was an attorney in South Africa, and he was thrown out of a train unceremoniously on the ground and he looks up and he says, I have a ticket, I have a first class ticket, how can you do this? That was the moment he decided that he would spend his life transforming India and helping create a structure for uh, correcting injustices. And he was an amazing man. So we have to have a mindset. And it starts with your mind's eye. Your mind's eye is part of your brain that focuses on whether something is positive or something is negative. And what is interesting is that the mindset has a default setting which is essentially negative. People are basically negative. Leaders must understand this. Now, if I ask you if you're positive or negative, most of you would say positive, I hope, or an optimist. How do we become this way? Well, it's not genetic not hereditary, it's based on a person, a mother, a father, a grandparent, a teacher, a boss, someone who helps determine how you focus your mind's eye. And have you ever met someone who no matter what happens, they see the positive? There's another set of people who no matter what happens, they see the negative. We have to understand the default setting is to see the negative about 80%, and it's like having a flashlight. And this flashlight can always find something positive or something negative. A leader must be positive. Now, you can deliver pain. You can get tough feedback. And as we go through understanding how to humanize the globalization process, how to bring sustainability, there's gonna be a lot of pain. There's gonna be a lot of change that happens. So the leaders must stay positive. That's one of my most important messages in a realistic way. And we call those people who are focused on the positive those who play to win. They play to win. And those who do not are defensive. They play not to win, not to lose. They're more concerned about making mistakes making failure, and we all know great leaders make mistakes. You have to make mistakes or you're not pushing the envelope. And out of this comes then the whole driving of change. Do people naturally resist change? Well, if you read the first line here, you'll see that people do not naturally resist change. This is a, a miscommunication.
communication and a, and a mindset problem. People actually thrive on change. The brain needs curiosity, needs change, needs new experiences. 15 minutes a day can inspire the brain, can activate the neurons to actually create new neurons. And some researchers believe you can actually sit, uh, sit back, set back or delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by spending 15 minutes of doing something new. One of our messages that we must create is that going green is going to be involving change and it's going to help bring about a positive outcome, not only for society, for nature, but for the individual. Because we're all going to be learning something new. But to do this, you need a trusted advisor. You need a trusted leader to endure change. And if that person is that, what we're going to call a secure base, people go through change. There's pain, but they're willing to do it. The question is, can we always find the benefit in the change? And in every change, no matter what, personal, professional, organizational, there is going to be a benefit, but you have to find it. And there are people who've had accidents, who've, who've faced loss of jobs, who've faced loss of parts of their bodies, and they've been able to recreate their life. And then we have to look at how leadership is about building talent. There are tremendous energies and powers inside an individual. Leaders are talent magnets. They draw people to them. And if we're all here with a common goal of helping to humanize globalization, help make the world green, and working at a one-on-one -on -one level, at an organizational level, and at broader cultural and society levels, we must be able to develop talent. It's going to require a new thinking a new way of approaching. And that's why those of you who are in education, and we heard our speaker yesterday talk about education, teachers are at the front line in helping change this mindset about how change and how money, how green is going to be part of life. And to do the second part, once you understand mindset, and by the way, if you are negative, that is the default setting. The only problem with being negative is you're probably going to die prematurely and you're going to make others miserable while you're waiting to die. <laughs> now, you have to be able to find another way to shine that flashlight, to mind's eye, onto something. And this is done primarily through relationships. Leadership is about relationships. It's not about the individual. It's about Servant leadership, it's about how do I serve my followers and how do we work together? You have to then create an attachment, be connected, and you have to be able to uh, create a bond, what is actually known as bonding. People who bond are able to engage in a process of building a collaborative relationship to accomplish something great. The problem is many people are not able to form bonds. They're very detached, very cold, very aloof. But there's one problem with bonding. All bonds come to an end. And it's called separation. Necessary endings, transitions, losses. You name the tragedies, the losses that occur. Out of this comes the grief process. And everybody has to face grief in one way or another. Organizations, individuals, families, teams, when something has a necessary, even if it's an undesired ending, you must go through this grief process. And the grief process is the most underspoken subject in organizations. It's how we deal with something that is lost as an expectation, lost as an, a, a, a position we wanted, and right into personal life. And we go all the way through these cycles, the anger, the emotions of fear and sadness, up through uh, acceptance and forgiveness and finally gratitude. Yes, forgiveness. There has to be in the leader a sense of compassion, a sense of empathy. That is part of what leadership is about. When you're asking people to change, you first feel the compassion that, that people are going to endure for that pain but you have to be able to see the benefit that's beyond that. 
that is where leaders often fail. They don't communicate well what the expected outcome would be. And then we get into conflict. Conflict is natural where people are connected because it's around difference. Differences between people, communication styles, values, you name them, the differences. But it only when the bonding is broken. You see, if you and I keep the bond and we have a major difference, we still do not truly have a conflict. We can have a small difference and the bond is broken, we will have a major conflict. Conflict is necessary and the dialogues that we are involved in having, we have to be able to deal with. And to do this through dialogue, dialogue is a key to understanding how to think together. Good leaders are not talking about themselves. Good leaders are interested in other people. One of the most, most early diagnoses of any high-performing leader is are they more interested in themselves, more interested in being an interesting person, or are they interested in others? And you can, ask by, you can tell by how many questions they ask in the first three to five minutes. And how do we then go to negotiation? And negotiation comes out of talking, comes out of dialogue, comes out of being able then to, through the relationship, do an exchange process, going from creating the bond down through what you want, what others want, getting a dialogue, knowing the goal, being able to look for options and proposals, coming up with a mutual gain, and then a contract, and your word should be a contract, and then finally the relationship continues or ends on a positive note. We have to stay in dialogue with all those people who do not have the mindset of how the earth is in trouble, how there is a large growing group of people who are being dehumanized by the globalization process. And we who live in Europe do not know what is coming forward unless you follow the global mindset. The rising middle class in Asia is dramatic. And those of you who travel to China, to Southeast Asia, Malaysia, you see they want to share in the good life. But the definition of a good life is consuming. And it can't work. It can't be sustainable. And that's why we have to understand how the pain of not having that future is going to lead to a greater good. And we need leaders who can handle that dialogue, handle that conflict, handle that negotiation, where you come out in a win-win position. And that means we also have to understand trust. Now, I always am interested in looking at what motivates a leader. What are the values? Leaders who have what is known as a vocation. And in a vocation, it's a calling. And it's a feeling a belief, a movement inside that says, I have a purpose. I have something I want to accomplish in life beyond just greed, beyond just money, beyond just consumerism. That is the mindset that has to change. And those of you who had a mother, a father, a grandparent, a teacher, a, a, a coach, a boss who helped instill that mindset, you're blessed. If you've not, you have to find one because to be empty in the end. There are very few people on their deathbed who say, I wished I would have made more money. I wished I would have spent more hours working. Most say, I wished I would have spent more time with my family, my kids, enjoying life. And how many people are really living their dream? A secure base is a person, a place, or a goal who actually provides a sense of protection, creates security and comfort to explore and take risks. You see, human nature, is not going to avoid conflict where it feels safe. The default setting in the brain is to have an early warning system that looks for danger. Once you feel secure, that's turned off, and then you have the opportunity for explosions, explosions of creativity. We need this creativity and this innovation to come up with the solutions that are going to move us into the future in a different way. And to be a secure base, you have all forms. It comes in people. It comes in goals. It comes in objects. It comes in dreams. You name what people use to inspire themselves, to feel confident, 
to feel protected. And this is where teachers come in, where leaders become a leader and not just a boss. They have to create that secure base trust environment, and that's where exploration occurs. It is not for, uh, for uh, just protection, it's to build self-esteem, to do new things. And secure bases create energy, and they do this by creating protection that allows exploration. Every leader must be not just a boss, but a secure base. Every teacher, and if you've had a teacher where your children have had a negative experience and they don't find them as a secure base, that's a problem. And a secure base does not mean you're touchy-feely and just soft. Secure bases deliver pain. They give tough feedback. Why? Because a good leader is able to deliver pain and people say, thank you. Give me more pain. Why would they want more pain? Because they see the benefit. The benefit. And there's the famous marshmallow test that demonstrates this. And when we look at leaders, we know that the talent of being a leader is not genetic and hereditary. Just about anybody can be a leader. We know also the bonding process. Men die 7 to 12 years earlier than women. The main reason? is the inability to grieve, the inability to deal with emotions. This is why th there is a growing research of who makes potentially a better leader, men or women. <laughs> Ladies, you're right. It's women. But I said potentially because women have to learn how to assert themselves. And there's the famous lemonade test in which you give salt in the lemonade instead of sugars. And the boys typically react with spitting out. And the girls say, mm, not bad. So how to assert, because a good leader must assert themselves. And when we interviewed 100 leaders from all over the world, this is what we came up with of who they found to be secure bases and how they saw themselves in being a secure base for others. Accepts and values others' opinions. Sees the potential of the individual, not the present state. Encourages risk. Inspires others through intrinsic motivation. We're going to hear from uh, Jimmy Wales, who, who opened up Wikipedia and took on Google's encyclopedia. Who's heard of uh, in, uh, the, the Google's encyclopedia? It's dead. It was motivated because people wanted to contribute. Intrinsic motivation, that's where it's at. And going all th the way through, being grounded and calm and listening and instead of advocacy and directing the mind towards the positive and using bullseye transactions. That's these short, simple ideas that you hold on your whole life. Ted Kennedy Jr. describes his father as sending him a message when he lost his leg and he fell while sliding and was ready to give up. Nothing is impossible. And 42 years later, he still remembers that. Now, in addition to teaching leadership, I also teach um, hostage negotiation and have worked as a hostage negotiator for some 35 years. Now, what does a hostage negotiator do? Because none of you want to be a hostage, right? But the problem is many of you are a hostage, not with a weapon, but because of the helplessness you feel. And all that I talked about, mindset, the bonding, the dialogue, the negotiation, all of that fits into being able to take yourself out of being a hostage. And how do you do that? What a hostage negotiator does is form a relationship with a hostage taker. And even if you don't like the person, you have to forge a bond. And through that negotiation, you're able to convince them to change their mind, give up their weapons, come out knowing they're probably going to go to prison. That's a pretty massive amount of pain. Do you know what the success rate is? About 95%. About 95%. Leaders don't come near to that. I myself was a held hostage of four times. And one of those situations was in a hospital with a very violent, psychotic man who put a scissors to a nurse's throat. And in the same room, he then switched over to me and put the scissors to my throat. He came out because I was able to engage him in a relationship, in a dialogue, to understand what would happen if he killed himself. The key question was, and questions are always the, the main tool of a hostage negotiator, Sam, how are your children going to remember you? Don't talk about my children. I'll kill them too. 
That was not the answer I wanted, but it was the first time he responded. We started a bond. And within 20 minutes, he was able to surrender. He left me handcuffing, giving him choice how to do this, and come out voluntarily. Now, this fits all those characteristics. Whatever situation you're in, can you create the trust to be able to have that? And the last thing I want to include for you, oh, I pushed the wrong one, is to remember that this is going to require massive rewiring of the brain. It's going to get an old new set of neurons working in a new way. And we can create neurons till the day we die. So remember, you have to stay positive as we face the challenges of changing globalization into a humanized process and going green. And the brain can rewire anything. That's the good news. It's what you pay attention to. And lastly, I want to leave you all with one simple, clear idea, and that is this. Great leaders, high-performing leaders, do not go where the path may lead. They go where there is no path and leave a trail. And I wish that for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.